My name is Ninmari Zapata and I am a Latina role model because I believe that you can overcome any circumstances that come in your way and be the best version of yourself. Hello, I'm Sandra Rivera and I'm a Latina role model. Whatever your struggles are in life, whatever you don't have or don't have access to, don't use that as an excuse for not pursuing your dreams and moving forward. Get out of your own way and get out of your comfort zone and you will be amazed at the growth that you will experience. This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. Welcome to Latina Role Models. My name is Lisa Pino, and today we have with us Yesenia, Yesenia Collazo. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. You, thank you for being here. Yesenia is a civil litigation attorney. So do you want to tell me a little bit about what exactly you do? What is that? Sure. Civil litigation is basically um, I either sue people um, for my clients or I defend clients that are being sued. And now that can range from anything, um, car accidents, suing your insurance company, homeowner's insurance, um, business lawsuits, um, anything that you can be sued for or anything that someone needs defending okay. if they're sued. Okay, do you want to tell me a little bit about how you came about deciding you wanted to be that? What, is this something you always wanted to be your whole life or was it more of something you came up with after like couple years in college. Yeah, well, I think that my entire life, everyone told me I should be an attorney because I was, um, I like to argue, I was always right, and mm -hmm. so people always put that in my ear. I think that when I was younger, I thought I was gonna be a big movie star. So now mm -hmm. I say that I always act like an attorney. Um, <laughs> once I started going into, um, into college and into the university, I knew that that's what I was gonna end up doing and being an attorney. Now civil litigation, I don't know if that's what I would have chosen. I think that um, I went into law school thinking that I would do criminal law. Um, the neighborhood that I grew up in, there were a lot of people getting arrested and um, I always thought that there w the way that I can help others is if I went into criminal law. Um, once I got out of law school, you really don't end up doing, most of the time at least, um, you don't end up doing what you set out to do. And I fell into civil litigation and civil law and um, I love it now. I couldn't even imagine doing too much criminal. I still take a criminal case here or there, um, but I love civil litigation. I love the civil procedure and the whole process, so that's what I like doing now. What's the something specific that you like doing, that you just love about it so yeah. much? I think that, um, you know, obviously helping the clients. You know, we get clients and there, for instance, I had, a client that suffered a great damage because of a building that she worked in for many years that had mold and mildew and she suffered um, from different, different damages and different injuries and being able to help her during that time when she most needed it, um, I really enjoy that. I love to see my clients get successful results and get compensated for their injuries. Um, so I think that's the part that I like the most um, when it comes to civil litigation. I had like one, one case that always sticks out in my mind was a homeowner's insurance claim. And this couple, well into their 80s, and um, they had a little townhouse that suffered great damage due to one, after one of the hurricanes. Um, insurance company paid them pennies. And these people, when I finally came into the case, it was at least eight months after the hurricane. And when you walk into their townhouse, you can see the sun. I mean, that's, there, wow. there were, the, the, the ceiling had a gaping hole and um, they would sleep in their car, an 80 year old couple sleep in their car every night with their little puppy and go back into the house with masks on just to watch TV, 
um, throughout the day or just kind of hang out so not to be in the car the entire day. And the insurance company did not pay them what they should have been paid. So we were able to um, get them enough money to fix everything in their house, take get all the mold out, buy new furniture, be able to get back and live in their home. Um, so that's one of the cases that always, you know, when things are kind of rough that you think And they were like that for eight months? At least eight months. I mean, wow. it took a few more months before we were able to get them, the, you know, their, their settlement recovery. So they were there for at least a year before wow. they were able to live back in their house. And, you know, you, you, you look at these extreme circumstances, and that's not even the most extreme. I mean, there are so many extreme circumstances that you think there, you know, there's insurance companies and there's individuals that are not paying these people what they should yeah. be paying them. Um, and for me to be able to give them a voice and for me to be able to give them someone to lean on and help them through the process and, and everything, it's um, something that is obviously very um, heartfelt and, and, you know, when the days are kind of rough and things are kind of tough, you look back at these cases and you're happy that you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything um, related to your background that you would say uh, helped you to choose to become this? You said you're Puerto Rican, correct? Right. I am and Puerto Rican. You um, live in Miami? I live in Miami. I've always born and raised in Miami. Um, did all of my education. Did um, undergrad. Where? Miami Day Community College, which okay. is now Miami Day College, and did my bachelor's degree in FIU. I think you said earlier that you also went to FIU for a few years, and then um, did my law degree in San Thomas University School of Law. So I am a Miami girl, true and true. Um, but I am Puerto Rican, and um, even though I've never lived in Puerto Rico, and I wasn't, I never even visited the island until I was in my 20s. Um, I, I am Puerto Rican, involved with many Puerto Rican organizations. Um, with including the Puerto Rican Bar Association that we spoke about earlier. Um, and I think all of those things, you know, the, the community that I grew up in was very Puerto Rican. All of my neighbors was, you know, were Puerto Rican. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them had never been to the island either until- Did you like it when you visited? Did you oh, visit a specific I part or all over? Yeah, I completely loved it. And I really did take a moment and took a step back and said, okay, do I love this island because I'm Puerto Rican or do I just love this island? And um, I, I was gonna love it anyway because I'm Puerto Rican, but I did fall in love with the island and with the people. And I think that anyone that, that visits the island and, and really feels the culture and the people and what they offer to, to the people that go there will end up falling in love with it. Yeah. Aside from all of, obviously, all of the negative things that we hear, the crime yeah. is, is, is but in reality, going. I think most islands in Central America and even in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. they all have those bad things. Correct. So you just have to look at the better things. Right. I agree. Yeah. I agree. What What part in, of Puerto Rico did you visit? Oh, I I visited you went the entire. Yeah, we actually mm -hmm. went for um, a week. I ended up staying a month and spent the Christmas and the New Year's there and gained fifteen pounds and <laughs> ate so much, ate like a beast. And um, I don't dance, and you know, to be Puerto Rican and not know how to dance, actually, I was told um, while I was there, very lovingly, um, that I, I dance like I'm killing roaches. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, 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 I visited the entire island. That's great. Yeah. It sounds like you definitely had a good time yeah, though. It was a good you time. You got that, that Puerto Rican feel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful because my mom left the island when she was just a child and I was able to take her back and we visited the home where she grew up um, and you know she got to see it and everything so that was great. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell me some challenges you faced while going through school. Were mm -hmm. there any hard times? I mean, of course, besides the long nights studying right. and the right. snacking on it and anything at four in the morning. Right. But any any challenges? Did you work mm -hmm. to pay for classes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like I said, I went to San Thomas, and if I remember correctly, we were not allowed to work the first semester because the, the, the first year of law school is so intense that you really need to dedicate all of your, um, all of your time, energy, and resources to doing that. But I was from the background that I needed to work. Um, so, and, and I was lucky because I did have a, a friend of mine that helped me those first couple of months. But yeah, throughout law school, I worked. 
Um, I, I was able to graduate a semester earlier, still while working and everything, and um, then was able to take the bar and, and, and get licensed and you know, not have to work and go to school at the same yeah. time. So some of the challenges, I mean, I think the challenges that everyone faces in law school, I think you're, you know, you, you're, um, you're used to being the smartest, if not, or one of the smartest in, in your undergraduate studies, and then you go into law school and everyone is... It goes, flips upside down. Yeah, they're <laughs> just as smart and, um, or, or smarter, and, and the whole method that they, how they teach you, the Socratic method, and you know, just give me the answer, why are you asking me questions? So all of those um, things that everyone deals with in law school were, you know, were obvious um, um, challenges. But aside from those things, I think the, the community that I was raised in prepared me for a lot of those things. Um, Some challenges within your career mm -hmm. where you've had a hard time um, with a client or, or they, ha they were in a very big struggle and you thought it was a challenge for you or it was a challenge that took many months to complete. Mm -hmm. What was one of those that you would say yeah. was the biggest? Yeah, well one of the um, challenges or one of the, the, the things that, you know, when, when you're doing criminal law, one of the challenges that you always, or at least I always take too much to heart is that you have a client that is being charged with a crime. He's either arrested or he's you know, in jail or outside. If they're in jail, then you're dealing with the family, you're dealing with the mother, and you're dealing with the crying kids and everything. So that to me is always a challenge that, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard for me to go back home after a day of being in a criminal courthouse and dealing not so much with the person that's being accused of the crime, um, but dealing with the mothers and the fathers and, and the kids. So th those cases always, um, pose a certain challenge to me that no matter how long I practice law, um, I think I'm, I'm going to always be affected by, yeah. by those situations. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, what are some goals you have set for yourself mm -hmm. or maybe some goals you had earlier in life where you've already accomplished? Right. Um, well, some goals that I've set for myself is, as I said earlier, I'm part of the Puerto Rican Bar Association and I am not only the vice president of um, um, Monroe County, Broward County, but I am also the chair for the Judiciary Committee. Now, this is the first year that we've done the Judiciary Committee, and what we're doing is we're endorsing candidates that are seeking to become our judges. So last year, last election cycle was the first time that we did it, and we did um, here in Orlando, and we did Day County and Broward County. Um, one of the goals that I have set, and along with my entire committee, and along with um, attorney Tony Suarez, who is the president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association, is to really go statewide and to try to get our hands on as many judicial races as possible. I mean, I'm hoping that we are gonna get to the point that every person that is seeking to become a judge in the state of Florida has to somehow be interviewed or go through us to get the, the Puerto Rican Bar Association's endorsement. And what that basically means is saying, we've taken the time to interview them, to do the research, do the due diligence, and we think that based on our due diligence based on their um, reputation, their skills, how they treat our communities. They're the best person to sit and represent us on the judicial bench. Once we issue those endorsements, what we've been doing is um, sending them out to newspapers, printing um, palm cards, and try to get those people elected. So I'm hoping to, to be able to go throughout the state of Florida. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. that's very good. Thank you. We're running out of time, so if you want to tell our young Latinas any recommendations you have for them or anything you want them, you think they should do in order to succeed. Absolutely. I think um, first and foremost, you know, when people look at me, you cannot help to know that I am Latina. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people see that being as a, a minority as a negative. Um, I'm, I'm a woman, can't help but see that. Another, what others might see as a negative, I, uh, um, I embrace those things. Embrace who you are, what you are. I am a Latina woman and I am great because of those things. I think those are very important factors that you have thank to keep you. in mind. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Well, thank you for being on our show, Jasenia. It was a pleasure interviewing you and thank learning you. a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Of course. My name is Lisa Pino. Stay tuned for our next Latina Role Model.
This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. I am for the child who's had seven addresses in a single year because she's in foster care, because her father abused her. And her mother? Her mother couldn't believe her. She is the child I am for. I am a volunteer child advocate. I am you. Florida residents call toll-free 866-341-1425. Hi, my name is Lisa Pino. I'm a Latina role model. I am a student at the University of Central Florida, graduating with her communication degree in December. My advice to students is to stay focused, stay dedicated, and don't let challenges bring you down. It is not about the goal, it is about the road. Remember to keep dreaming, live genuinely, and never stop dreaming. Pursue your dreams, but enjoy the moment. Good evening and welcome back to Latina Role Models. I'm your host, Sandra Rivera, and our special guest today is Joanna Lopez, and she's here to share with us uh, a book that she uh, is publishing. Welcome. Thank you, Sandra. Now, can you tell us, uh, first of all, the title of the book? Well, the title of the book, of the book is Mujeres Aprendamos de los Hombres, Coño. Okay, <laughs> and for uh, some of the viewers who maybe don't speak Spanish or have it as a second language, what does that mean? Well, is woman learn uh, learn from men. Damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the expression. Right. Okay. So, your message is teaching women. Is it geared towards women to learn life lessons from the men in their lives? Well, not exactly. It's more to open their minds and just increase their self-esteem and empower their self based on their experiences. Okay. They have to break um, that um, traditionally belief in that we're always wrong, we have to feel guilty, you know, I did something wrong, what, what did I do because he just left with another woman, you know, it's just to just make us more conscious of, about our, our, our power. Stop taking the blame for everything. Exactly. Okay. So what led you to write this book? I mean, why did you feel like you needed to put this message out there? You know what? When I talk to friends and even my experience, personal experience, I believe that I have to share what I experience, be um, a victim of domestic violence mm -hmm. and, you know, stop that um, cycle because I believe that I was capable to make a change in my life and be an example to my daughters. And when I start talking to another friends, women and men, I found out that they have similar um, patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. And I just share exp exp my experiences and also my friend experiences from men and women and just try to analyze that is not our fault, it's not their fault, is that we have to identify our expectations in order to make the right decisions. Okay, and so you pull from your own personal experiences and you said your friends' experiences, did you have the opportunity to, um, in your research of it and, and drafting the manuscript, did you have an opportunity to talk to other women, you said that you found similar patterns. Is yes, that where yes, you found that? Yes, okay. yes. I just talked to them. I did not tell them that I was writing. Right. I just talked to them, interact with them, you know, talking through phones and just watching people interacting to, you know, to other people. It's something that, you know, women need to know that they don't need another person to be happy. Mm -hmm. You can be alone and be happy, you know? Sure. You just have to be happy with yourself mm -hmm. first in order to be happy or share your happiness with somebody else. Okay. Now, the title, Women Learn From Men, why did you decide to title that? I mean, it, what, what are you saying in the book that, that we need to learn from men or what qualities or characteristics do men have mm -hmm. that women should be because adopting? Because it's specifically the gentleman. Mm -hmm. It's not every type of man. Okay. It's only the gentleman. We can learn from the gentleman, and the gentleman 
can learn from us, mm -hmm. the ladies. Okay. And you know, it's to break that belief that it's because I am a feminist person, I don't want to know anything about men. No, mm -hmm. I, you know, we have a lot of good sure. men and very, you know, excellent men. And the same thing, you know, on the other way, you know, you don't have to say all oh, the women are the same. No, we're not the same. You know, we are different. And you know, anything is nothing is wrong with that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just to emphasize that we can learn from each other instead of just separating ourselves to, you know, because I'm a woman and that person is a man. Now, can you tell me a little bit about, um, is there anything specific in the book that you reference what we should learn from a gentleman, as you said? Yes, I have a chapter okay. that enumerate all the, <laughs> the aspect that we have to learn from them you know, from the gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And for example, sometimes I saw gentlemen aligned to each other, you know, supporting each other. Okay. And I think that we have to improve that uh, as a woman, you know, we have to align to, wo to women instead of just criticizing them, you know, why as a woman I have to criticize another woman? No, I have to align with her and try to understand, you know, what is happening in that specific situation. Right, that's a good point. Do you find that, um, in your uh, interactions with women, uh, in your research for the book, uh, that there is a lack of support in the female community yes. for each other. Yes. And I think, um, I think it's so important because we, mm -hmm. we can empower each other. Yes. Is that kind of a message that you're trying yes. to um, encourage women if to um, make friendships with other women Absolutely. and use them yes. to... Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And also with, with men. Mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes why we have to expect that the man is always the one who invite us to eat. We can invite them to eat also. Why we expected that they open the door for us. We can open the door also. Mm -hmm. You know, because we are equal. And that's the, the message that I want to, you know, to um, express at all time that we are equal. We are not better than them, but they are not better than us. We are equal. So do you, uh, so with that message, are you doing away with that whole mentality of male chivalry where men are raised to pull the chair out or open the door for a lady or, or treat them like a lady? Are you doing away with that concept? Well, I, I want to break some of the beliefs that make us just be this a copy of 100 years ago of mm -hmm. another woman. You know that sometimes we just go with the flow because we learn that from our parents or our um, mothers is something that we have to be more flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes do not don't judge because he doesn't open the door. Maybe he didn't learn that, okay? Well, we can teach them. I could open it for you now, but you know, later we could do it and, you know, just do it in, you know, certain times, you know. I think that if we want to be pampered, they they love it too, you know. It's mm -hmm. something that we can do it, you know, to each other if we decided to be with somebody right. because it's okay to be alone and we have to be happy, you know, because I have a chapter talking about how good it is to be alone if you decided like, you know, to be alone also. Okay. Can, and how do you in the book, how do you um, advise women to adapt to the idea of being alone and, and being strong in in your solitude you know what um it's amazing when you know yourself mm -hmm. and you know your expectations in life and you know how much you could do for your community for your community for your family that you just feel so realized with yourself that you're gonna be always busy doing something for you and for others sometimes you don't need you know you don't need um to be with a partner um, with a traditional partner behind the same roof. Mm -hmm. You can have so many friends that, you know, they don't live with you. You're not alone. Specifically, you have um, times that you're alone to work on your um, dreams, on your, just depend on your expectations. It, okay. It's nothing wrong to be alone. It's just what are your expectations in life. Mm -hmm. It depend because um, there's something that I said in the book that no puede vivir solo el que no puede vivir acompañado el que no puede vivir solo. You cannot live with somebody if you cannot live alone. Sure. Well, because yeah, you don't know yourself that well that you cannot live alone, you know? I'm amazing. I can live with myself, right. you know? <laughs> Something that is amazing, okay, I'm going to enjoy being with myself. Also. And I think when you learn to do that, uh, you learn 
what you can bring to a relationship. You learn yes. what you, your worth and oh, what you have to offer. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what finally gave you the courage to write a book like this? Because this is your first, right? <laughs> yes. the first time you've written anything. Yes. Because, you know, every single time I talk about it, everybody was so interested and mm -hmm. keep laughing and laughing because, you know, the book, uh, I have a lot of quotes from my country, from Puerto Rico. And, you know, if you're uh, a Puerto Rican or Latin American, you can identify those quotes and you can make so many inferences about that. Mm -hmm. That's why I try to write, you know, very short book because I know that only with the quote, you, you can imagine so many paragraphs, paragraphs and experiences in your mind. And also because when I try, I just, when I, before I just got the book, I just have the papers and give it to people, different mm -hmm. ages, 50, 20s, you know, and every man, woman, and I saw the faces of the men say, that's so true, that's so true, oh my God, and they just shake my hands, okay. and even the woman, oh my God, I can't believe this, you know, it's so true, I never think of that way, right. yeah, oh, you know, and I think, oh, okay, that is something, that, something. Uh, yes, yeah. because, you know, different ages, same expressions, mm -hmm. is something that I just wanted to, you know, to share, even the, the publisher, when I call her, I was, you know, I was trying to change one of the, of the aspect that we need to learn from the men, and I, and she called me, you know, and she told me, why are you gonna raise number, and put that? Why, you know, the the per, you know, we are here just talking about it, and I just want, you know, to ask you, and I told her, do you really believe that I couldn't change it? You know what? don't change it, just add another one. That's why I have 21 aspect okay. instead of 20. And she just, um, after that, she texts me, you know what, we are really happy. We're, we are very happy that you just put it back. You know, that mm -hmm. something is there that, you know, make, make her happy, right. uh, make her laugh. Now, I know that you wrote it in Spanish, so obviously, yeah. unless you're a Spanish speaker, or you have to be a Spanish speaker yes. to read it, but were you trying to write it with the mentality of the Latina woman and the, the culture that that we live in and are raised in yes. um, with the men and the women, is it geared uh, with that mindset? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's why um, on, the argument, on the summary of the book, mm -hmm. I specify that is something sociologically um, speaking mm -hmm. because it's about our society. Yes. Okay. It's Latin America, it's, you know, it's Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, it's, yeah, it's here in Orlando, Hispanic people also. Sure. My mom talking to me, you know, my daughters asking me questions. It's something my friends that are from different places around the world, but Hispanic, you know, most of them that, because the people that I choose to, to write the book is Hispanic people, mm -hmm. okay? That, from Latin America and Colombia, Cuba. Getting that message yes. out to the culture. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're also a teacher, a high school teacher? Yes, I'm a okay. high school Colonial teacher. high school? Yes. Okay. And do you have... Uh, in your exposure to the students, do you have the opportunity to uh, give these lessons to your students, whether it's in the classroom or just you know, out in the hallway, giving them advice on how to be a strong woman, how to be strong men? You know what? Um, I, I have a, an AP Spanish literature class that um, gave me the opportunity to talk about genre. Mm -hmm. And in that aspect, we always have conversations about how the expectations of the men and the women in our society, sure. in our Hispanic society, or in the United States, or in, you know, around the world. And is when I take the opportunity to make them think about the um, patterns that they are developing um, through their lives because of their belief or right. traditions. Okay. Well, I wish you the best of luck, and Thank I you. hope you have lots of sales. And uh, it's you. a great message. I appreciate that you. you're putting it out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Attorney Santa Rivera. We'll see you next week. This show is brought to you by Boricua Beer, coming to your local retailer in September. My name is Raquel Garzon and I'm a Latina role model. My advice to you is to always be yourself, be authentic, 
and to do always what you believe is the right thing. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cooper and I'm a Latina role model. If you want to do what I did in my life, you want a success for your life, stay focused. Don't stop believing in yourself. Write down your goals and I will see you at the top.